Good morning, Vietnam! All was fraternity, Frank. Also, the Pope decided today to release Vatican-related bath products. An incredible thing. Yes, it's a new Pope on a rope. It's right. Pope on a rope. Wash with it. Go straight Hello, to everyone. Thank My name you. is Dr. Bill Roach, and this is another episode of Timeless Dialogues. And today is Reformation Day. And one of the mottos of the Reformation was sola scriptura, scripture alone. And one of the key things that I want to do is I want to discuss this issue of which Bible translation should you be reading? Now, one of the key things that they did during the Reformation is that there was a strong resurgence under this phrase known as ad fontes. Ad fontes is this idea of going back to the original sources. And that's so much of what the Reformation sought to do, is it went back to the original Greek and the original Hebrew in order to provide a solid translation, a word-for-word -word translation of the biblical text. But this also raises a question for each and every one of us here today. You know, there are so many English translations of the Bible out there. You go into a Christian bookstore and you are met with what seems like a dozen different translations. And I want to answer the question, which one should you read? In particular, I'm going to give you four that I recommend that you could read and significantly benefit from. However, before we do that, can you please do me a favor? Can you please comment below what's your favorite translation of the Bible and why? I can deal with all the different you know, comments. I've heard many of them, but I'm interested in what you have to say. And what I might do is take some of those questions and make more videos going forward. So a few things before we dive into this. Some people might be asking the question, well, why in the world should we talk to you about Bible translations? Aren't there other people that we could look to about this very issue. And I agree, you know, there are probably people out there who are better at the original languages, can give you significantly more details as it relates to Bible translations. But what I'm trying to do is my part today in order to equip you so that you can go to your local bookstore or search online for the translation that's gonna serve you best. But I also wanna say that it's not like I'm a novice in this arena. First of all, I'm an ordained minister. I was ordained back in 2008. I've served in several different churches. I have an undergraduate degree in Bible. I have a master's in New Testament and Greek, and I have a PhD with a special emphasis in philosophy of hermeneutics. Now, another thing that I've done is that I have taken the languages at every single level of my undergraduate and graduate and further post graduate education. I started out by taking Greek in my undergraduate. And one of the reasons was because I was a Bible major. We had to understand what the Greek New Testament said in order to provide good translations to help with ministry. That's one of the key reasons that we were translating the biblical text. I was also slightly introduced to the study of Hebrew during that time. And one of the reasons that they had us study Hebrew was so that we could meaningfully engage with the text, but it was done through a variety of tools. It wasn't done through, you know, significant, rigorous translation. That came much later. Now, when I got into seminary, I had to take several years of both Greek and Hebrew. My main emphasis was on the Hebrew, I mean, on the biblical text, but it was on the Greek biblical text. And I took several, several years of it, and I've taught Greek, and I could feel very confident in my ability to read the Greek Septuagint and the Greek New Testament. But my Hebrew, I still need to work with a lot of the tools. I have a lot of friends that nerd out in that arena, and I have to, in many respects, default to them and use that. We're the body of Christ. That's what we do. But what I want to do here is, is I want to talk just a little bit about why you might need these different translations. You've got the Masoretic text, which would be here, your, your Hebrew Bible. And that's what is predominantly used for the translation of the Old Testament. Now, one of the things that you're going to find is, is that there are two big divides within the text type of the New Testament. You have what's known as the Textus Receptus, and that's the text type that was used in the translation of like the King James Version and elements of the New King James Version. But then you also have what's known as the critical text, and that's going to underlie things like the New Testament translation of the NIV, of the ESV, the New American Standard, and so many more in that regard. 
Now, one of the things that you've got to see over this divide, and we'll talk about this as we get into the translations, is that it's an issue of when you're looking at the critical text, you're dealing with the older, more reliable manuscripts that have more of a substantive base to justify what that text is saying. And because of that text, many scholars today prefer to use it. And like I said, that's the one that's going to be under the NIV, the ESV, the New American Standard, and so forth. But you have also this issue of the majority text, and I don't want to get into that too much. It, you have this strong relationship between the Textus Receptus and the majority text, and you see the outworkings of the majority text brought into the New King James Version. So the King James Version is primarily off the Textus Receptus, whereas the New King James is going to interact with the critical text and the majority text and the Textus Receptus. We'll make a whole other video on that at a later time. Now, another thing that I want you to see is, is that when we pick up these different translations, we also have what could be known as the Latin Vulgate. And the Latin Vulgate was a translation that was given to us by Jerome. And Jerome was using, in many respects, many of the best manuscripts that he had at the time, but it's also written in Latin. And because of the spread of the gospel to different English-speaking and non-English-speaking countries and the decline of Latin in the West, a new translation was needed. Now, one thing that I want to do, one thing that I think is of just significant importance is, well, why do we need it? And you know, in the New Testament, where Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or it's, or it's near. Do you know how the Latin Vulgate would have translated that passage? It translates it by saying, do penance for the kingdom of heaven is near. So when you see the resurgence of the Greek text and the necessity of it for Christians, there's a significant difference between repent for the kingdom of heaven is near and do penance for the kingdom of heaven is near. It truly is the difference between a Protestant understanding of salvation and the Catholic sacerdotal understanding of salvation. So there are significant reasons for wanting to have the Greek text brought into the English translations that we have today. But with no further ado, we'll set this aside here. I want to discuss just a few of the translations that I would recommend. Now, one of the first ones that I would recommend is the King James Version of the Bible. It's also known as the authorized version of the text. And what you're going to find in that translation is that it's going to give you an older language but it's the language of the English speaking world. So many phrases that we use today are found within the King James Version of the Bible. That era of English is what was foundational to so many documents that we've read, so many sort of phrases and colloquialisms that we've used throughout the years. So, in many respects, not only are you going to use what was probably one of, if not the most influential English translation of the Bible, but you're going to realize that you're picking up on so much of your English speaking history at that point. Now, like I've said, what you're going to find in the King James Version is that it's going to use the Masoretic text of the Old Testament. They're using the best manuscripts given to us in the Hebrew language, and that's going to be something you're going to find in virtually all the translations. But what you're going to find is, is that you're going to see people who are using the King James Version, because they believe in the text type known as the Textus Receptus. And this differs from both the majority text, even though there's strong similarities, but it differs in many respects in significant ways from the critical text. And the critical text here is really the one that the vast majority of scholars use, and we'll discuss that here in just a second. Now, there are also other key reasons that you might want to read the King James Version of the Bible. Namely, it's one of the most memorized versions of the Bible. You're going to find people who are usually of an older generation that have chapter upon chapter of the King James Version memorized. And some of it is, is that there's a cadence to it. There's a flow to the King James Version of the Bible that you would think it would make it very difficult to memorize, but with a little bit of effort, sometimes it's actually so different from what you're used to that it makes it easier to actually memorize it. And in so doing, you get to know the different 
translations and the flow of the biblical text. You know, I remember we had this guy that was in a church that I got saved in, and this man could quote chapters of the Bible right off the top of his head. It was almost just mesmerizing to listen to this man operate. And, you know, he'd be in a Sunday school class or he'd be out on the street and it would just exude from him. But it was funny because he ended up using more of the updated English translations. But whenever he had to speak out in a class in the sense of add his comments to it, he'd never quote from that. He would just quote from memory that text. And there's really something to come in with that. There was a generation of people that significantly worked to hide the word of God in their heart. And many of them did it with the King James version of the Bible. Now, another reason that we need to be familiar and interact with the King James version of the Bible is that it was in many respects, the Bible used by the English speaking reformers and the Puritans. It was also the text and the translation that was used to undergird the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And we could even say the Savoy Confession of Faith that was given to us. So many of the reasons that you need to have a King James Version of the Bible is because it has such a prominent place in the English speaking world. You're going to learn from it. You can do your devotionals with it. But there is one other issue that I want to deal with related to it where the divide comes down. Now, one book that I would recommend on this as I pull it up here is it's titled The King James Version Only Controversy. Can you trust modern translations? And this is by James White. And here's a few things that I want you to see when it comes to why people would pick the King James Version of the Bible. The first one he says is this. Sometimes people pick it simply as he says, I like the KJV the best. It's something that you grew up with. You like the cadence of it. You like the way that it translates the different phrases from Greek into English. So you pick it because you like the translation. It just is something is resonating with you and you find it just subjectively appealing to you. So you pick that. And in that, I have no problem with it. The next one that he says here is the textual argument. And notice what he says here. A large spectrum of people came together in the second group joined by their common belief that the underlying Hebrew and Greek texts used by the King James translators are, for various reasons, superior to all other original language texts. These individuals would not necessarily believe that those texts themselves are inspired, per se, but they are more accurately reflect the original writings of the prophets and the apostles. So he goes on to explain what he means here. He says there are a number of possible positions that fall within this one category. One group that would strongly reject the term KJV only, but believe that the Greek texts used by the KJV translators are superior to those used by modern translations would be the majority text advocates. This view asserts that the best reading should be the one supported by the consensus or majority of the existing Greek New Testament manuscripts. Now listen to what he says here. However, these individuals also would point out that the majority text differs and a number of places from the Greek text that was used by the KJV translators, a text that became known as the Textus Receptus or the TR. Others would support the TR over the majority text, often for reasons derived from theology and practice more than from the manuscripts themselves. So this is a group of people who are wanting to use this because they say, I'm committed to a particular underlying Greek text. But there's another group here that says that they only want to use the Textus Receptus. And he says here, this next group of individuals would insist that the above mentioned Textus Receptus or received text either has been supernaturally preserved over time or even inspired and hence maintained in an inerrant condition. And listen to what he goes on to say here. They would believe the same concerning the Hebrew text utilized by the KJV translators. This position would not necessarily insist that the KJV is an inerrant translation of these texts, leaving open the possibility of a better translation. Rather, their focus is upon the differences between the Hebrew and Greek texts used between 1604 and 1611 in the production of the King James Version and those texts used today in translation of such modern versions as the NASB and the NIV. So the point is, is that they are going to be using the King James Version because of the underlying Texas Receptus. Now, 
He goes on to say this, the reasons used to support this view are varied. Some see the providential hand of God in the work of those who created the, these original language texts, which would include men such as Desiderius Erasmus, Stephanus, and Theodore Beza. Other reason back from the fact that God has blessed the resultant translations, feeling this shows God's favor towards those texts. Now, one thing that I would encourage you to do is that if you're a person who affirms one of these types of positions, please comment below about why you affirm that position. Which one do you actually affirm? Is there a, a particular reason that you have turned to that? And what reasons would those be? So let's keep going here. There's another group here that you would see that they're called the inspired KJV only group. And this, he goes on to say, most King James Version only advocates would fall into this group. They believe that the King James Version itself as an English language translation is inspired and therefore inerrant. Think about the difference between that. They're not only saying that maybe the underlying text would be inspired if we had the original text, but they're trying to say the actual translation of the King James Version itself is inspired. There's a big difference between those two in that regard. He goes on to say this, many of these folks believe that the TR is inspired and inerrant as well. It would seem logical that the text from which the KJV was translated would have to be inerrant if the resulting translation is to be considered inerrant. But in practice, the importance of the TR begins to fade when the direct claim of the King James Version's inspire or inspiration is put forward. So the point that we have to see here is that these people are going to argue that the true word of God is found in the particular translation of the King James Version of the Bible. Now, there's one other group here, and he says that this, it's the KJV as new revelation. He says the final KJV only group we need to introduce occupies the most radical position in the spectrum. These people, while mentioning at times the Greek and Hebrew texts, the academic credentials, the King James translators, and the doctrinal superiority of the KJV, in reality, do not rely upon such things. They truly believe that God supernaturally inspired the King James Version in such a way that the English text itself is the inerrant revelation of God. Now, I will just be upfront and honest with you. I do not hold to this KJV only approach. I think that there are many reasons for you to reject such approach. I think that the idea that the English language version of the KJV is the inspired text is not only just flawed as it sits on the page, but it actually undermines the historic understanding of the doctrine of inerrancy that the formal inspired texts are the originals, not just the copies of the originals, but the original Greek and Hebrew text. Now, do the copies reflect that insofar as they rightly reflect the originals, you better believe it. The authority of it can still carry on, but the idea that the English language version of it is somehow inspired, I would not hold to that. And in fact, I would encourage you to get James White's book on this matter to see many reasons why you should reject that. I'm also not a TR guy. I'm not a Texas Receptus guy. I hold to the critical text. And that's why I prefer other translations. But again, like I've said, I would highly encourage you to read the King James Version of the Bible for those very reasons. But let's jump to the next one. The next translation that I would tell you to look at would be the New King James Version of the Bible. Now, what this has done is it's overcome many of the issues that some of us face. Namely, when you read Old King James Version English, it's very difficult to understand. We all realize that these and the thous and the arts and all the rest are something that just doesn't resonate with many of us today. And the reason is, is that the English language changes over time, as does every language. It begins to change over time. And what they sought to do in this translation is that they tried to keep many of the phrases in the King James Version, but bring them into a form and into a, a way of communicating that the modern man can understand. Now, just like the King James Version, it still tries to be a very, you know, word for word translation. It tries to use what it considers to be the best text types for those translations. So in that sense, it's a literal word for word translation. But what makes it different and what probably makes it more useful is that it updates the language in important ways 
so that it's more readable to people just like you and me. Now, one of the things that we find is, is that so many people today, like we've said, they don't speak that way. And if one of the hallmark issues of the Reformation, this idea of getting the scriptures to the people of God, or the idea of, I want every plowboy, as they would say, to know what the text of scripture says, in this day and age, when people can barely, you know, write anything more than, you know, little acronyms on Twitter and emojis, King James Version English or King James English doesn't really resonate. So I really would encourage you, if you want to understand this great tradition, the King James Version, but you want to read it in a more understandable way, you need to get the new King James Version. Now, other things that you can find is, is that there are several churches today where the, the preacher is going to use the King James Version of the Bible. And what we find is, is that some of the more modern English translations, it's hard to just follow along with what he's preaching on. But if you bring a King James Version and a New King James Version and you lay them side by side, it's going to be much easier for you to have a more up-to-date English translation and you can follow along with your pastor. So you can both read it and follow along in the church service. Now, one final thing that I want to say here, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on the New King James Version, is that if we're going to understand the King James Version as dealing with the Textus Receptus and many of the other translations with dealing with the critical text, one thing that's unique about the New King James Version of the Bible, and you're going to find this in their apparatus and the way that they're going to give you special footnotes, is that it does a good job of bringing in to this whole discussion, the majority text, which is another sort of related text type. And I don't want to dive into this. We'll do a whole video on this later. But what it's going to do is it's going to show you the different readings of where the majority text might go with it or where the critical text might go to it. So those of you who are interested in diving into that particular debate, you're going to find having a new King James version of the Bible will benefit you significantly. So again, I would tell you, get the King James and the New King James for the sheer fact that they have such a prominent history within the Western world. Now, I want to jump into another translation here. And the first one that I want to look at is probably the most popular English translation that people are using today. And that's the English Standard Version of the Bible. And in many respects, this version of the Bible is in keeping with the great language tradition that you find in the New King James, the King James Version. But one of the key differences is, is that in its New Testament translation, it is committed to following from the critical text, which has the more older manuscripts and the more scholarly manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And for that reason, many scholars and pastors and academic theologians are drawn to this translation and this text type because it's in keeping with where the academy is and because so many seminary professors and so many theologians use this text they required it for their seminary students who then in turn used it throughout seminary and they brought it into the various churches and it disseminated its way into the pulpits and into the pews and even into people's home offices like myself here and what it does is it is very good in that it retains the beauty and style of the previous translations. And it's going to offer a very literal translation of the text. It's going to be a very word for word, not just a, a thought for thought, but a word for word. Because if we believe in a doctrine of inspiration, we want to get down to every sentence, every word, every gender, case, and move. That's where we're, we're arguing for our doctrine of inerrancy. And insofar as our translations reflect something like that, we believe that it carries the authority of the original text. But it's going to do it in a way that's going to be a, a very beautiful, readable, understandable English translation. And I would highly commend it to you. Now, another thing is, is that it's going to use a very updated English translation. It's going to be a very modern translation. Now, by modern translation, it's not going to be esoteric or something that's not very relevant to you, it's going to use the language that you're used to using. And it's a language that you're used to reading and speaking with. So in that sense, it's going to be something 
that you can readily apply to your day-to-day life without having to have an old English dictionary in order to just get through a particular epistle or something throughout the biblical text. Now, another thing that you're going to find is, is that there are so many study Bibles today that are going to use the ESV. I know that the Reformation Study Bible, both the old and the, the newer one that Ligonier has put out, they use the ESV. But in particular, probably the most popular version is the ESV Study Bible. So one of the things that you're going to find is, is that there are study Bibles in all of these different translations. But a lot of the contemporary academic evangelical work that is being done by faithful scholars who are committed to the inerrancy of the Bible, they use the ESV and it's reflected in those good study Bibles. So if you're looking for a good translation with a good study Bible, grab yourself a good ESV. Now, what I want to do here is I want to talk about the final translation. And this is really the translation that I use. And it's the New American Standard version. Now, the New American Standard, like the ESV, is going to use the Hebrew Masoretic text in that sense, as the other translations did, but it's also going to use the critical text. And one of the things that you're going to find with the New American Standard is that it's probably the, if not one of the best, word for word translations of the biblical text. In fact, as I was going through seminary, this was the key text that many people were using because in various places, it actually gives you a clearer and more literal understanding of the biblical text. And you know, there's a few places that we could discuss this with where it can really make a significant difference, especially as it relates to the ESV. I can go back and forth between the two translations, but I think in particular in 1 Corinthians, in the way that they translate when Paul talks about the various different sins, and you're going to see in the ESV, it's going to talk about and men practicing homosexuality. And it's going to take that notion and translate it as one conceptual phrase. Whereas one of the key things about the New American Standard is that you're going to see their translation philosophy coming out and that they're going to break that up because there's actually two phrases that are used there. It's not just men who are practicing homosexuality. It's talking about both the active participant and the passive participant. Or one could say, both the pitcher and the catcher in that regard, if we wanted to be a little bit more uh, graphic in our illustration. But what you're going to find is, is that in many ways, the New American Standard is going to have a more consistent word-for-word translation that's even going to get down to some of those very basic elements. But there's something else that I like about the New American Standard. You know, when you're reading through your ESV, it has a fairly similar script that's out there. I mean, literally the way that the words are written on the very text itself here on the paper. And one of the differences with the New American Standard is that we realize that when we're doing a translation, sometimes we have to add auxiliary words or little helping words that are going to fill in the translation. And one thing that you're going to find with the New American Standard is they actually let you know that by putting them in italics. So as you're going through, you know that they added this. It's still within the sense of the original Greek, and it had to be brought out to be a good English translation, but they're adding those as auxiliary words. But what I want to do, one more thing, I actually want to give you a fifth translation. And this is one that I've been reading, and some people would say, well, it's not much different from your last one. And what it is, is it's the Legacy Standard Bible. And what you're going to find with the Legacy Standard Bible is that there was a, a few issues that were going on. First of all, how do we translate certain words? So one thing you're going to find with the Legacy Standard Bible is that they're going to consistently translate the word doulos as slave because they're committed to this idea that the rightful understanding of that is that it's not just servant or bond servant, but that it's slave. Another thing that you're going to find is, is that there's really just been this divide that's been happening within the New American Standard. And you're finding that there's a a later edition that's come out of the New American Standard in which they're updating things. And some of the issues that they're doing is they're a little bit more uh, lax or liberal as it relates to things such as gender inclusive issues. They're doing away with some of the well-known 
key passages that they were translating. And, and unfortunately, it's moving a little bit more left. So the Legacy Standard Bible wants to retain that conservative history while bringing meaningful updates to the biblical text. And not only is the word slave a key thing, but they also go through and they realize that you have the Tetragrammaton in the Old Testament, and they translate that as Yahweh. They're recognizing that that is a real word that can actually be translated in the Old Testament text, and they make that apparent. And one of the reasons that they do that is, is because, well, that's God's covenant name in the Old Testament. There are different ways of saying God, Elohim, or what you're going to find is Yahweh. And the classic way that the New American Standard translated is whenever Yahweh, they would put it in Lord, but it was all capitals. And then if you had capital L and then lowercase O-R-D, that was going to give you this concept of Adonai and translations along those lines. But it's probably a better translation. In fact, it is a better translation. It's actually a translation to use the word Yahweh, and it makes it easier as you're reading the biblical text to look at it in that regard. So the translation that I prefer is the, the New American Standard version of the Bible, and I also use the Legacy Standard. Now, I'll also use and read the English Standard version. You can get the New American Standard and some very good study Bibles. So that's something that it also brings to the table. But the reason that I like it is because I like the critical text. I like the literal translation. And I think that they're a consistent literal translation, not only in the places that everybody agrees about, but in particular in the areas where people would disagree. And that brings me to this final thing that I want to look at is that I want to give you just a few translations to avoid. And I kind of want to give us this, this call to why we should understand and learn the biblical languages. So I'll start with the later. The reason that you need to learn the biblical languages is because we have so many of these different English translations. You can't always rely on a team of translators. It is worth your time to learn the biblical languages, memorize the vocabulary, learn the grammar, learn the syntax so that you can read the biblical text yourself. You know, a way that I've heard it explained is that there are different ways that you can watch a football game. You can watch it on a black and white television, or you can watch it on a colored television. Now, if you watch it on a black and white television, you're going to see who won the game. You're going to see all the major plays, and you're going to understand the big flow of what's gone on throughout that game. But sometimes, if you have a colored television, you're going to realize, was it this person's hand that crossed or that person's hand that crossed? Namely, you need the colored television for the close calls. And in that regard, that's exactly what the biblical languages are going to provide for you. Yes, your English translations are like the black and white television. You're going to get the big flow. You're going to understand the big picture. And you're, in many respects, going to be changed, sanctified, and, you know, worked in your sanctification unto the image of Christ. But on the close issues, you need to learn the original languages. That's our Reformation history. Now, a couple others that I want us to look at here. So you have the, the NIV, the 1984 edition, and many, I mean, sorry, the 1994 that you could find with it, some of these older editions in there, is that it offers a, a new translation done by the critical text and it's a thought for thought translation that's been given there. But what you're going to find is that, sorry, I was right. It was the 84. Please forgive me. It is the 1984. I had to look it up. All these different ones. It's still a good translation, but it's more of a thought for thought translation. It's not as much of a real translation as it's going to be a word for word. And a lot of people used it because it was the first big translation that you could read that wasn't like the King James Version. It gave you a readable text, but it wasn't so archaic in that regard. Now, some translations related to that is that there's the updated NIV, and I would avoid that altogether. I literally wouldn't buy it. I don't think it's worth your time. They, in many respects, have gone down that thought for thought avenue too far, and they've worked to update the, the language of the text to all these gender neutral, gender affirming concepts. Now, I don't think they're trans in that regard, but they're trying to give the this idea of we don't want to translate it 
as man, but this idea of humanity and, and those kinds of concepts. Now, I understand what they're doing, but the issue is that the original writers of the biblical text weren't doing what they're doing. Now, other translations that I would tell you to avoid altogether would be things such as the New Revised Standard Version and even some of the Revised Standard Version. And the reason is, is that so many of the people on that translation committee were frankly on the left. And while we can correct that in that, that broader translation history and things such as the ESV, you should just avoid the New Revised Standard Version. Because, for example, when they translate Isaiah 7.14, they don't translate it as virgin, but as young maiden or young woman in that regard. And you find those kinds of issues because their theological and their philosophical presuppositions are determining what they're having to say about the translation of the biblical text. Now, I would also tell you to outright avoid the New World Translation as it is nothing more than the Jehovah's Witnesses understanding the Bible. It has a terrible understanding of the Greek text. It's going to undermine the deity of Christ. If you want a translation of it, ask your local Jehovah's Witness to give you a translation of it and keep it around whenever you do apologetics with Jehovah's Witnesses, but don't use it as the Bible that you read because it's not really a reflection of the Bible that God gave us. One final one that I would tell you to be very cautious about is I would tell you to be cautious about The Message by Eugene Peterson. Now, I know Eugene Peterson had a strong background in the original languages, and I know that he was able to translate the biblical text, and a lot of people say that he remained faithful with that, but the problem is, is that the message doesn't always reflect that. There are some places where you read it and you go, not only is this different than what I'm used to, sometimes it's just flat out wrong, and there's a lot of work that's been done on it, and at a later time, we'll make a video. So, with no further ado, what I would really tell you to do is this, is that I want to hear from you. I want to hear after this video, which translation would you prefer? Which translation of the Bible would you pick up and read? Are you going to do the King James, the New King James, the English Standard, the New American Standard, the Legacy Standard, or is there something else that you would read? If so, please leave me a comment below. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with your friends. Again, thank you and we appreciate it. was fraternity prank. Also, the Pope decided today to release Vatican-related bath products. An incredible thing. Yes, it's a new Pope on a rope. It's right. Pope on a rope. Watch with it. Go straight to heaven. Thank you.